It's podcast time, and today on Rambling About Cars, we are not rambling about cars because for the first time in over 30 years, there is a legit new Jeep Grand Wagoneer, and this thing literally just debuted. If you missed the the big debut yesterday, we're going to tell you all about it right now. We've got all the information. We were at the backgrounder. We're going to talk about the features, what makes it something pretty incredible. We also have some pricing. What makes it grand? Thank you. We're also going to talk a little bit about price, which there could be something to talk about there. That said, ladies and gentlemen, oracles of off-road, it is time to talk about some cars. I'm Christopher Smith. Across the way, as always, is Chris Bruce. How are you doing, Bruce? I'm doing great. Um, I want to welcome back Brett Evans, MotorOne.com senior editor. He was with us last week to talk automotive pop culture, and he's coming back to talk Grand Wagoneer. He was our guy on the in the trenches to at the backgrounder for the Grand Wagoneer. He's going to be writing our post about the Grand Wagoneer. He is at, at this moment. He knows more about the Grand Wagoneer than anyone else in the world, and I this will is back true. that up. Don't, uh, don't undersell it at all there, man. You're making me sound like a loser. <laughs> true facts. No, no, this is this is true. I'm not making this up at all. Jeep is actually calling Brett to uh, to verify information. That's, that's right. That's how detailed we got it right now. And then later on in our second segment, we'll be talking about luxury SUVs in the U.S., kind of in general, just kind of a history lesson about that segment because it's – it's kind of an interesting history. So it is. without further ado, let's talk about the Grand Wagoneer. Let's jump right into it. And I mean, this has been coming for a while. We had the preview with the, while. with the um, with the concept that was out uh, a few months back. And it was pretty well known that, okay, the concept, pretty much the road going version, just with a few changes here and there. Um, if you're following us on YouTube, you really want to follow us on YouTube for this one um, because we have photos. Uh, you can see what the new Grand Wagoneer looks like. This is a body on frame SUV. I mean, this is for the purists out there who love their definitions of vehicles and get really specific. This is a body on frame SUV um, that's based on the Dodge Ram. <laughs> I still say Dodge Ram after all of these years. Don't do that. Don't do that. Can, can you believe that, folks? I know I'm not alone on that. It's based on the Ram 1500. Um, it's got V8 power. Brett, since I'm sitting here just rambling, why don't you tell us all the details that we need to know here? Or get us so, started, and then we'll pick up Get us started. There. So first off, we need to talk about the naming structure because Jeep has the Wagoneer. They have the Grand Wagoneer. They have the Cherokee. They have the Grand Cherokee. It is, it is super confusing, but I'm going to boil it down really quick. The Cherokee and Grand Cherokee aren't related at all, so we're just going to put those to the side. The Grand Cherokee is a two-row midsize, uh, mid-size unibody crossover with uh, four-wheel drive capability, and the Grand Cherokee L is a midsize three-row. The Wagoneer wait, and Grand wait, wait, wait. Wagoneer... So, just, just to clarify, we have Grand Cherokee, we have Grand Cherokee L, yes. and now we have Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. Yes. So, okay. Just, yeah. So unlike the Cherokee line, the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer are not two different vehicles. They're the same right. basic vehicle, same basic structure. They ride on a like 120 inch wheelbase, 123, I think, inch wheelbase. So these are big vehicles. They're also both body on frame, both V8 powered um, and with, you know, genuine low range, two speed transfer cases available. Um, these are kind of intended to do battle with like the Chevrolet Tahoes and the Cadillac Escalades of the world, where the Grand Cherokee is more targeted that mid-size crossover like SUVs like the um, Honda Pilot, Passport, uh, Ford Explorer, and Dodge Durango. So um, naming is kind of confusing, but you can really easily remember that if it has a Wagoneer in it, it is a full-size body on frame three row. If it has Grand Cherokee in it, is a, it is a mid-size uh, two or a three row SUV. So super confusing. Hopefully that clears it up. Um, standard on the Wagoneer is uh, the 5.7 liter e-torque Hemi V8 found in the uh, Ram 1500. Standard in the Grand Wagoneer is a 6.4 liter Hemi. Um, lots and lots of power on that one. It produces, I'm gonna pull it up so I don't misquote it. Uh, it produces a pretty incredible 
Um, well, it was 400, 400 and, 400 and, 471 horsepower, 475 pound feet. That is a lot of power for, even for a large SUV, that's definitely going to, going to get up and move. Um, however, even the 5.7 does pretty good. 392 horsepower, 404 pound feet. Um, those numbers put it, you know, near the top of, of both of their respective classes. The, um, Wagoneer is more powerful than the Expedition. It's more powerful than the base model Tahoe. The Grand Wagoneer is more powerful than both the Escalade and the Lincoln Navigator. Navigator does make more torque, but you know it's just kind of a kind of that balancing act of what you want more. So these are big, huge SUVs. They also have best-in-class third-row cargo, uh, third-row passenger space, and best-in-class cargo room behind the third row. Um, a ton, a ton of space in these. This is definitely Jeep's largest offering yet. Takes it into an all-new segment. Um, this, this. A lot to talk about, so uh, so we can kind of get into some of the details here. <laughs> a quick question that I have, uh, just to make sure it's clarified for everybody listening out there. The Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer, those are three-row only, right? Or can yes. you get them with it? Okay. Okay. Yep. But that's that's are- a good distinction to make. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is kind of a, this kind of harkens back, or this doesn't harken back to the original Wagoneer, which was a full size two row SUV with tons and tons of cargo space. These are three rows standard, um, eight passengers standard on the Wagoneer, seven passengers standard on the Grand Wagoneer, but you can flip flop both of those by ordering either a bench seat or a captain's chairs on, on the, the respective vehicles. So huge SUVs, tons of space, um, tons of headroom and legroom, even in the third row. Um, Definitely, definitely a new market for Jeep, a new market for Fiat Chrysler as a whole or Stellantis as a whole. They've never produced a full size four door three row SUV like this for any market. So this is this is kind of brave new territory for Stellantis. Well, and And, I think a lot of people are scratching their heads as to why this didn't come sooner. And Bruce, Mm -hmm. maybe this is this is going to allude to something that you were going to talk to us about. Um, I mean, we've had. We've had General Motors with the Suburban, the Tahoe, the Escalade, big body on frame SUVs. We've had Ford with the Expedition and then the Lincoln Navigator, big body on frame SUVs, no other competition. And it seems like it's taken decades and well, it has taken decades to get here. Why the heck didn't Jeep do this sooner? You know. So thank you for that segue. Um, I did some research today at MotorOne.com, and Motor One, through its predecessor, which was World Car Fans, we've been around for a while. I want you guys to guess when was the first time that we heard that a the Wagoneer was going to be revived, and it was confirmed. What, what year would you <laughs> guess that that happened? The fact that you mentioned World Car Fans means it's probably pretty old. I mean, I've been writing here at Motor One regularly since 2017. And I mean, I feel like there were already some some mentions at that point. So I'm going to have to, I'll toss it back and say, I mean, let me, oh gosh, let me rack my brain here a little bit. 20, I'll say 2010. 2010. Okay. Brett, what's your number? I am trying to remember. I feel like I was at the the press conference where they confirmed that it was coming back, but but I've only been in this industry since 2014, so I don't know if I'm maybe retconning my own memories. Um, I'm going to say 2015 is is when I'm going to say that we knew officially that the Wagoneer was returning. Okay, well, I, I, judging by um, uh, prices right rules without going over, I. <laughs> Yeah, Smith win, wins it. It you are going. Oh, I just lost the thing. When was it? There we go. It is January twelfth, twenty eleven. Wow. Was Jeep Grand Wagoneer and pickup confirmed? And that wow. pickup we now know is the Gladiator. So over a decade, yeah, we have been waiting on this vehicle. And and I. It, I, I I feel like that that Jeep has talked about the Wagoneer moniker um, even before that. Um, I, by, there's nothing that I can put my finger on, but I feel like especially has the uh, the luxury SUVs like the Escalade and the Navigator really picked up steam. People were looking over to to uh, Daimler Chrysler and then Fiat Chrysler and saying, "Okay, where's your offering?" Right, and, and then. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. just real quick. Here's no, a story ahead. from 2014, which is actually, for anyone looking at this, is a 
Fiat Chrysler, well, 2014 would still be Fiat Chrysler, yeah. Yep. Um, their product plan showing Grand Wagoneer here at the bottom that it was supposed to arrive roughly the third quarter of 2018. Wow. So Better late than never. This is a vehicle we have been waiting on some folks for a decade. And even if you look at their product plans for what, 2014 to 2021 for seven years plus, like th- this vehicle has been a long time coming. You know, it, it just kind of goes to show I think a lot of people don't understand just how far ahead most automakers are thinking when it comes yeah. to, to their product development. A decade for an all-new vehicle mm-hmm. isn't out of the question. And when you think about how fast the industry is evolving right now, especially with SUVs, um, you know, I would really like to know just how many changes the Grand Wagoneer went through before we finally got to the final product that we're yeah. looking at today. Now, my personal opinion... I think it looks pretty good. I think it's a pretty attractive SUV um, all the way around. And I mean, it, it sounds like it has uh, some great features. Um, Brett, do you, do you have some information on, on some of the tech that's going on inside of this thing? It yeah, has some I, very impressive tech. I've, there's, yeah. there's a lot of technology going on. So the, the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer both are going to use uh, um, Stellantis's new Uconnect 5 infotainment system, which is pretty great. It offers over-the-air updates and lots of modern features that you like oh, to yeah. see see in a new car, which is very cool. Um, the uh, the like electronics package is is pretty stellar. Um, even the Wagoneer, the the base model Wagoneer, is going to get a 10.1 inch center touchscreen display with a 10.3 inch instrument cluster. Um, the Grand Wagoneer gets a 12.3 inch instrument cluster and a, uh, let me see if I can find it, 12 point, it's a 12.3 inch instrument instrument cluster and a 12 point, uh, 12.0 inch, I've got that wrong, I'm sorry, I'll find it. Uh, but a bigger, a bigger way, center. They're big, the bigger, folks who are looking bigger. at this on YouTube, like they can see, th- this thing has a lot of screens. Well, and- what and really gets me how similar it is to the concept too. I yeah, mean, yeah, for sure. We all kind of thought that that uh, that passenger touchscreen right in front of the uh, in front of the passenger seat on the Grand Wagoneer, we thought that was kind of just like a concept Guga, but it actually made the jump. That passenger touchscreen is really cool. It doesn't. It's not just like a regular. Since it's on the passenger side, it actually serves as a full blown smartphone mirror. So you can oh. plug your phone in, and wow. whatever you see on your phone, you see on the screen. So you can like type emails using an on screen keyboard. You can do anything like that right from your passenger touchscreen. You can also um, find, uh, you know, like select a destination or find a restaurant or something like that, and send that over to the driver's center touchscreen and the driver can accept or reject it. So mm-hmm. you can really kind of do a lot of cool co-pilot stuff from that screen as well as do your own thing. You know, if you if you have some work to get done on a, on a long trip, you can do it right from there if your phone's plugged in, which is really pretty impressive. Um, obviously, you know, wireless CarPlay, wireless charging, a lot of those features are going to be available. And then most interestingly um, to me is this this uh fourth screen at the very bottom of the center stack which is going to serve as your like climate and comfort screen um it's Mm -hmm. available on the wagoneer i believe it's standard on the grand wagoneer um and it's going to be able to do a lot of pretty cool stuff like seat massage um heating um hvac controls lots of lots of things like that and um, since Uconnect 5 is a very user-friendly um, infotainment system, I think this is going to be a better solution than, than similar systems that you'd find on like the Land Rover, um, Range Rover products and, uh, and the, Audi, um, the Audi twin screen MMI system as well. So lots of technology. There's also two um, dedicated uh, rear seat in- entertainment systems uh, for each rear seat passenger. They can run different different media content. So one person can watch something and another person can do something else. Um, And then they also get uh, on the Grand Wagoneer, they get that same 10.3 inch climate display on a center console in the rear seats as well. So there is so much technology going on. There's just just screens everywhere. And I I really like the passenger side screen. I think we first saw this on the, was it the Taycan, the the Porsche Taycan where where they, where they offered, where they offered the passenger passenger screen. And it was like, wow. Well, what is the passenger? I mean, why would you need a a screen for the passenger? Brett, what you were just talking about, how the passenger can almost serve like a co-pilot. Check this out. Quick navigation stuff. Send it over to the driver. That's 
for me, that's like, that's one of those no brainer moments where you say, why didn't somebody think of this earlier? Instead of stringing all of these screens together, like kind of like we see on the Escalade where it's like one, this big block of screen mm-hmm. from the driver's side, basically to the center stack. And then the passenger kind of has nothing. I, I, I'll be honest. I'd like this setup better than the Escalade. I think so too. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense to kind of separate tasks and, and, and dole out specific, specific jobs to, to passengers. And, and that way, you know, my, whenever I'm riding with my boyfriend and, and I'm trying to fiddle with something, he's always like, Oh, just let me do it. And this would just be a much better solution where, you know, oh, totally. he'd be like, Hey, you know what? We're running low on gas. Find us, a, find us cheap gas nearby and he can just pull it up. And, and uh, that's, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that's a really clever way of integrating technology without making it distracting. And in fact, reducing driving driver distraction through technology, which I think is a, a huge, huge advance that the Wagoneer has on its competition. I also I also think it's worth pointing out the material quality, what we're seeing here. Brett, you didn't actually, have you gotten to sit in a Grand Wagoneer yet? I haven't yet. And okay. if you want some in-person feedback, you should definitely check out Motor One's YouTube channel where we actually, we do have a, a an in-person walk around that, um, that uh, managing editor Brandon, Brandon Turkis was able to take part in. Um, and he'll be able to talk more to some of the materials quality. Um, I'm not going to be surprised if it's class leading. I mean, it's it's not as though Jeep doesn't know how to do a good interior. Even on the Grand Cherokee, they do a very high quality, pleasant interior. This is just going to be that plus a little bit more. Look at all that wood. There's so right, much. That's what I was thinking is that not only the amount of wood, but the different types of wood. That So you have the wood on the dashboard. You have the different finish on the center console. You have tons of leather. You have different colors of leather, but yet the stitching matches. The the stitching on the dashboard matches the color of the leather on the seats. Like it, They really paid attention to fit and finish here from what it looks like. Um, it, it's pretty impressive. Definitely seems like a pretty cohesive design, which I, I really admire for them. I think that's a very, very clever use of materials on their part to kind of, they say that um, the, especially like the interior wood trim is is specifically designed to recall the wood trim on the original Wagoneer, the exterior wood trim on the original. I don't, you know, I th- they probably couldn't get away with exterior wood trim, even as like a retro throwback. I think, I don't think it would work on a modern car. And I think so, they could. I think it could do. I think there's a, I think if you put it as an option, I think that there would be enough people to buy it to make it a viable option. But All right. Sure. I'll, I, I disagree, but I will totally let you guys have that one in my, in my head canon, The reason that they did all the wood on the inside is because they couldn't get away with it on the outside. How about they, how about they prove me wrong though? I honestly would love to see it as an option. You know, that'd be a lot of fun. I, I don't know if it'd look good, but it'd be a lot of fun to see it on, down the road anyway. Well, I will bet a gazillion dollars that there will be a wrap or something come out very, oh. very soon. I wouldn't even be yeah. surprised if we see some sort of optional add-on uh, in, in an aftermarket sense coming from Jeep just because the original Grand Wagoneer and the Wagoneer, I mean, that was a definitive look for that car. I actually have a picture. Let me let me pull up a picture really quick of sure. the uh, of, of the original well, not the original, but the the one that bowed out in I think it was 1991, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly, is uh, right. is when it bowed out. And I tell you what, I mean, Jeep kind of let the styling flounder for a while. When you look at this thing, you think, was that really 1991? And here it is. And I mean that uh, I mean that has a real 70s kind of styling to it. They just kind of let it go for a while, but. Yeah. There's there's such a following for that vehicle holding its boxy shape, holding its wood size. And when you think about it, um, Chrysler and Dodge through that era, I mean, they did the same thing with their trucks back when the Ram was still Dodge. It was still a Dodge Ram back then. I mean, they're, they're 1970. I think it was their 1978 um, yeah. Ram styling endured all the way through 1992. So, I mean, it's certainly a throwback. And I don't know. Maybe this old wood styling, it it would look awkward. I, I'll I'll be honest. It would look awkward on a new Grand Wagoneer. I but I would still like to see enough. somebody try. I think it's been long enough that you could have it make a comeback and it might work. You, you could maybe opinion. call it like a like an homage, a retro homage rather than like a And I'm not saying that it shouldn't be standard that way. Like no one would want that. But I think if you offered it as an option, I think there are enough people that click that box. 
Well, so well, well, gentlemen, what do you think we make a we make a little friendly wager right now in the next three years? Will we see some sort of wood exterior addition special come out? Some special package? What I mean, they think? did it on the PT Cruiser, so so anything's possible. They, they did. I, you know what? Put me put me down for put me down for ten bucks that before twenty twenty five we'll see some sort of Wagoneer wood exterior special edition. So I just want to mention the photo we have up now, which is kind of a close up of the center console center stack, and it just looks really good. Like the combination of the wood, the leather, the stitching, the metal touches, the um, the uh, oh, what, not equalizer. I can't think of what you call the um, yeah, the decimal old, meter um, on the stereo. Macintosh, those Macintosh gauges that they repurpose for the digital screen. <laughs> like there are so many really good like classic it, touches, but it's a, it's still a, look good today. It's a very and, old school look. It it, it really yeah. is on those screens, and also for people that aren't huge fans of touch screens, there are still some manual functions on here. Not many, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, it, I'm a little off on this, Brett. If you're if you're a little bit more in the know than I am, I mean, there are still some basic. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So, so some basic controls that you can operate by hand that you don't have to cycle through a touch screen for. They made a point to ensure that there was a uh, there was a separate manual control, physical manual control for the volume, for the tuning, um, for basic. Um, you know, HVAC adjustments like fan speed, temperature, things like that, heated seats. Uh, they absolutely made sure that there were physical hard buttons that you could actually press. And then there's also capacitative buttons that pull up um, rapid menus like uh, driver assist and things like that. So so there are a few quick capacitative touch buttons that they made sure to, to include and then actual physical buttons, which, you know, volume and tuning, that's really all you need for, for the uh, infotainment. Those are the only like really quick things that you really need and everything else can kind of, in my opinion, can be handled by the touchscreen. And, um, but good for them for including that because, you know, we've, we've seen manufacturers decide to go full touch with volume, with tuning, with HVAC and everything like that. And it never works out well. They always within, you know, within a year or two, they always end up bringing physical, physical controls back. So good on Jeep for, for doing it this way from the start. So I think it's time that we address an elephant in the room and that's price. And while we have been <laughs> lauding the Grand Wagoneer for, you know, 20 minutes now, I we wonder have, we have if gotten the price a little, is going to be an issue here. We have gotten a little quiet all of a sudden, haven't we? Yeah. I'm just so, waiting for one of you to start making an argument so I can tear it down. Oh, oh, okay. Boy. So the Grand Wagoneer, it's what? Eighty six nine nine five. Is that yeah? Is, am I correct there? You Starting correct. price for the Grand Wagoneer eighty six thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. For the record, that's just about ten thousand dollars more than the starting price for the Escalade. It's about ten thousand dollars. It's about ten thousand. I've got a little cheat sheet here in front of me. It's about ten thousand dollars more than the starting price for the Lincoln Navigator. Um. It's about twelve thousand dollars more than the starting price for a BMW X7. It's eleven thousand dollars more than the starting price for a Mercedes GLS. Um, the really the only luxury SUVs that are matching it for price, the Lexus LX starts at ninety two thousand dollars, which is and of about course, to be retired. Which is about to be retired, and of course you have the Range Rover that starts at ninety two, and and the Range Rover once you start throwing options i mean we're talking well 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 over a hundred thousand dollars so jeep has a pretty good looking grand wagoneer but i mean let's talk about this brett they are jumping very very far into the deep end of the pool here and they are, apparently are not pulling any punches at all yeah rip yeah. this argument apart because i'm curious they're definitely making a splash this is the most expensive jeep vehicle by far, I think it's even more expensive than the Grand Cherokee Trackhawk. Um, the like the yeah, black that's pack like edition, like, the, like high seventies, I think. Yeah, the fully loaded like black pack edition with all the goodies is uh, ninety eight thousand nine hundred something dollars to start. So with destination, it probably is actually more than a hundred thousand dollars. This is a very expensive car. I'm not going to deny that one little bit. 
Um, I am, however, going to say that um, the the Grand Wagoneer comes standard with four wheel drive, which is a three to five thousand dollar option on um, on Lincoln and on okay. Cadillac well, SUVs. That's, that's okay, halfway so you there. Got seven grand to make up. It's about halfway there. And and the Grand Wagoneer uh, offers uh, nine thousand eight hundred and sixty um, maximum uh, towing capacity of nine thousand eight hundred and sixty pounds, which is far and away more than you get on either Lincoln or Cadillac. Um, I think those are pegged at right around uh, 7,800 to 8,200, depending on configuration. So yeah. if you've got a large trailer, you are, you're locked into the Wagoneer. You can't, you can't go Cadillac, Lincoln, Lexus, any of the, any of the others. Um, so I think that kind of is where it really gets to plant its flag is that it doesn't really sacrifice any of that robust, you know, Ram 1500 capability for all of the luxury features you find inside. Um, there's also, um, you know, this is probably going to be an optional extra, so it's going to bring that price up even more. But there is a full hands-off um, active driving assistant feature that's going to be coming later this year. Um, it's going to do battle pretty effectively against Cadillac's uh, Super Cruise, um, and it's going to do more than um, Lincoln, Range Rover, or Lexus can do with their driving assist system. So, so there's another little trump card for the Grand Wagoneer. Um, you do, I will fully admit, you do kind of have to buy into the uh, to the nostalgia of owning a Wagoneer branded vehicle if you really want to make the dollars and cents work for you. But I, I personally, I totally do. I don't necessarily think this is a terribly um, exceptional follow-up to the wag the original Wagoneer, but I do think that it kind of captures enough of that spirit of like really premium, really exceptional off-road um, towing capacity, like like a very full, well-rounded um, experience like the original Wagoneer did. So I, I kind of buy into it. I think that there are a lot of reasons why it's worth the extra cash. Um, capability alone, you know, if you, if you've got a big trailer, you're locked into the Wagoneer, you can't do anything else because that's the only one that can really handle, handle those heavy loads. Um, yeah, but with your big trailer, I mean, if you, if you have the, the means to plunk down 90 grand for a luxury SUV and you have a big travel trailer or something that you're pulling around, you probably also have a 2,500 or a 3,500 Ram it's all decked out with leather and all your toys inside, and you're going to be towing that with a trailer. So I, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not sure the towing capacity really makes much of a difference to people shopping the Grand Wagoneer versus, say, an Escalade or, you know, as we saw a, a Mercedes GLS or a BMW X7. You know, it's I, I applaud Jeep for taking this step, I but I do have to seriously question if they're trying to reach too far too fast i mean they have to kind of establish themselves in this segment this is a brand new step for them and at the end of the day we're still talking about jeep we're still talking about the company that puts out the wrangler and some considerably less expensive less frilly vehicles i mean it's not like um uh, Jeep has its own addition, its own luxury brand like Cadillac or or Lincoln. I mean, well, this is this at the end of the day, it's it's still a Jeep. It's a good looking Jeep, but it's still a Jeep that all optioned up will most likely go over a hundred grand. So to that end, though, um, Smith, the Jeep is a Jeep is kind of a very like um, cross sectional brand that in that a twenty five thousand dollar Wrangler gets sold just as easily to you know, kind of like moderately, moderately well-off middle-class individuals, as well as it does to fabulously wealthy people. I mean, there, there are millionaires out there who drive thirty-five dollars or $40,000 Jeep Wranglers because that's what they want. So I think that they do a really, they don't necessarily need to do that like brand establishment that some of the other um, automakers do. I think that they can really kind of come in very strong with a very expensive, very premium product and not have to justify it because enough people out there already own and love Jeeps of lots of different socioeconomic statuses that they don't necessarily need to convince them, hey, we're going to sell you a $100,000 car. These are the same kind of people who who might also have a fabulously expensive luxury sedan right next to their lifted Wrangler Rubicon. And if you can kind of be like, hey, you know what? If you don't want two cars, you can combine the two into one and we will offer you the best of both feature, best of both vehicles in one easy package. I think that they, they're they uniquely positioned to be able to, to actually make that claim. Whereas, you know, asking someone to spend a hundred grand on a Chevy Tahoe might be a bit too much. I think you can, you could probably ask people to spend that much on a Jeep and they won't, 
they won't balk too much. Um, well, you know, we'll I mean, see. It, it, it's, it's a fair argument. I'll give you that. I think it's a lot easier to sell a millionaire, a $25,000 Wrangler than it is um, somebody making 50 grand a year in this $100,000 uh, Jeep. Yeah, you're right about that. His, 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 I'll go ahead and say, I will say this though. Um, let me pull my cheat sheet back out here. Cause I was, cause one of the things that I was wondering, okay, we're talking six figure vehicles here. Do, do we know yet? how how much the uh the grand wagoner could get do do we have any info on like like a most expensive model yet we don't have full blown pricing uh including options and stuff like that the grand wagoner obsidian is coming later this year it's going to be that like i said it's that that black package with the blacked out wheels and the dark um metallic finishes okay. and everything like that that's going to be $98,995 plus destination okay. so that will probably so that, that, Very that's easily press yeah. hundred thousand dollars. Yes. Yeah. That's that's a yeah. that's a six figure vehicle. So I mean, just I was kind of going over my little list here. Um, you know, when we knew this was going to come out. Um, I mean, we're talking rarefied air. Mm -hmm. Six figures is not cheap. I mean, fifty grand isn't cheap. But I mean, when you start talking about a six figure vehicle, I mean, there are a lot of houses that go for that much. Yeah. So and I mean, clear what the average car today, I believe, is. 32 or 33 grand so if you're talking 100 then that's three times the average vehicle yeah right and and when you look at its competition i mean we have just a handful of these luxury suvs that are at that price point so i mean i, and I already mentioned most of them um we have the escalade obviously the lincoln navigator can get 100 grand the bmw x7 the mercedes gls the lexus ls the range rover I mean, those are your kind of your, I guess, if you can call it a core six figure luxury yeah. SUV group, I'm excluding the performance vehicles, you know, like, like the M yeah. models, yeah. the AMG models, people that are buying those, they're not buying those because they're luxury SUVs. They're buying them because they're luxury SUVs that go like hell. Um, and the Jeep Grand Wagoneer isn't, I mean, it's well, with the 471 horsepower engine, it won't be slow. But it's it's not going to be something you know like an AMG class that's just going to yeah. rip yeah. rip up the tarmac. So, I mean, we're talking very rarefied company here for this brand new vehicle. Last year, Cadillac though sold twenty four thousand five hundred Escalades. Yeah, they sold sixty three thousand four hundred and forty Yukons though. Um, I mean, what else is what else are we looking at here? The X seven BMW they sold twenty thousand. X7s last year, Mercedes sold 22,000 uh, of the GLS. You've done your um, research, sir. Poor, poor, poor Lexus. I mean, here's here's why the LX is going away. Lexus sold 4,500 of those last year. Um, so, I mean, people are buying them, but obviously yeah. the, the much larger segment is the next step down where you start seeing 100, 200,000 some sales. So, I mean, Brett, did Jeep give you any sort of expectation on what they hope to sell? Um, in, in the first year in, in classic PR speak, they do not set, <laughs> they do not set expectations. Uh, they're, they're, I, you know, one of the, one of the nice things about the, um, Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer kind of a, a trait shared with, uh, the Chevy and, and Ford SUVs as well is, um, it shares a lot of its underpinnings with the uh, with the pickup trucks that mm -hmm. from each respective manufacturer. It's also built on the same Warren truck plant as the Ram 1500. So so they they have some economies of scale that they get to work with here, which is kind of nice. They don't necessarily need to sell you know uh, twenty thousand dollars to break or twenty thousand units to break even on on stuff like that. They can probably sell a much smaller number um, in order to be be financially successful. Um, uh, I don't remember where I was going with that. I would probably say though they, they could probably they could probably realistically move ten to twenty thousand between the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer combined. They could probably move ten to twenty thousand pretty easily, um, you know, and 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 make it make a little bit of a dent in the market in that respect. And that's what I was going to mention too, because I think we kind of glossed over Wagoneer pricing. Yeah, Wagoneer, you're still getting the large body on frame yeah. SUV. Its starting price is much cheaper. It, it, fifty-eight, it's like, is that right? Fifty-eight. So, I mm -hmm. mean, that's I mean, that's within the realm of a fair amount of of family yeah. these days. Yeah, and and that certainly, I mean, in my mind, that makes a little more sense. Although, when you compare apples to apples, that's still coming in a little bit more expensive than mm -hmm. the suburban, the Tahoe, and the Expedition 
from Ford. So, I mean, Jeep is still yeah. upping the ante a little bit there, but it's it's not as bad. And if you're tired of just having two choices for big body on frame American SUVs, now here's here's your third. Yeah. Here's your third with a Wagoneer. Yeah. And it, and it kind of carries the same premium. One one nice thing about um, sharing a body with the Grand Wagoneer is it kind of has the same cachet. It might work against the Grand Wagoneer, but it works for yeah. the Wagoneer, kind of, you know, elevating the brand a tiny little bit. Um, it also comes, you know, standard with leather seats are are on every Wagoneer, Wagoneer trim level, and so um, that kind of elevates it a little bit, makes it slightly more of a premium SUV compared to like the Tahoe LT or the Expedition XLT. It is still expensive though, you know, you're, like you said, it, it's about eight to $10,000 more than the rest of its body on frame, you know, full size competition. And that's nothing to sneeze at, that's a lot of cash. But wow. it is something new for the market and hey, there's, I think we're just at the very beginning of really seeing just how far Jeep can go with its mm-hmm. with its new step back into the genre. Um, Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer. If you didn't get all the information that you wanted on this podcast, we do have debut articles up at motorone.com. We have we'll also have a video that video. Yep. yep. That, uh, that uh, Brett mentioned earlier, Brett, what are we, what are we overlooking here on the Wagoneer, the Grand Wagoneer that we haven't touched? Yeah, is there any last little bit that we didn't, get to didn't mention i mean this this is just literally a huge product for the company this is the biggest thing they've ever sold the biggest thing any of these you know former chrysler corporation brands have ever sold this is a huge hugely important product huge profits to be made for the company if if they sell even a few of these they'll be doing very well um and it's very important that they that they're successful in this segment because it really will kind of kind of change the course of Jeep in the future. If they can really kind of make a big splash in this near uh, $100,000 segment, they might be able to establish themselves as a true American premium luxury brand. That's pretty cool. Um, if not, it's still going to be, you know, a, a big Husky body on frame V8 SUV with 10,000 pound towing capacity. And and that's pretty cool too. You know, mm-hmm. haul, haul eight people and a big boat. That's, that's a good time. That's definitely a good time to be had. So I like it. I'm looking forward to seeing it on the road and uh, yeah. Well, and if anybody out there listening, if you have any questions about the Jeep Grand Wagoneer or the Wagoneer, um, check us out at motorone.com email podcast at motorone.com. If you have some specific questions, Hey, we'll take a look at the email. We'll see if we can get back to Absolutely. you directly on some of those questions. Um, this is literally a brand new vehicle. This has this podcast airs. It debuted yesterday has we're recording. It debuts tomorrow. We actually delayed our recording by a day just to make sure we had this information to present because honestly, yes, it's expensive, but it's, it's important. It's, it's that important of a vehicle right now. Jeep hasn't had this vehicle for over 30 30 years years? yeah 91 yeah it's 30 years 1991 and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the second half um bruce let me let me take a quick moment here on the intermission just to remind everybody follow us subscribe at youtube you can follow us at spotify you can follow and subscribe apple google if there's a podcast somewhere that you don't see us on that you listen to Email us podcast motor one.com. We're happy to be there. One thing that we're working on that we're still in the process of that I want to remind everybody about is we want to hear your stories, your mm-hmm. car stories. We've had some sent in and we appreciate those that have come in. We would love to dedicate one of our future episodes to you because we're rambling about cars. Yeah. And as much as Bruce and I tend to ramble, we would love to ramble with other people. So we are very keen to share your stories um, and share and, your cars. Like if share, you have a share really cool project car that you're really proud of, send it to us and maybe you'll be on as a guest. Like, yeah, that, we're totally that, not opposed to that. As, not a uh, bit. You know, as long as your, as long as your little office is pretty decent looking, um, e- even if you sit in your car and just join us from your car. Hey, you know what? We want to talk to you. We want to have a good time talking about cars. Yeah. No. Yeah. We want to see your car. We want to see your project car. The one that sits in your garage, you know, for three seasons out of the year and just sits there during the winter that you wrench on and it's finally ready to go. We want to see that because 
that's what's cool. That's what keeps this going. That's uh-huh. that's what keeps the whole car community going. That's what yeah. that's what binds us all together. And even if you're driving it through the winter, some of us do tend to drive yeah. our our quote unquote project cars in the winter, especially. And this is just hypothetical. If you have a Mustang and you are able to get out before the salt trucks and the sand trucks get out to where you can just blast through hypothetically six to eight inches of fresh powder in your neighborhood hypothetically who does that that that, that could be that could be a very very memorable experience especially if you don't hit anything like you did the last time so (laughs) send us those stories um before i incriminate myself anymore bruce why don't we move into the uh, into the second half here and the second half we're going to move kind of quick because yeah we're we're, we're talking about yeah um we want to talk about the history of luxury suvs in the united states because as we were talking about There is history. And weirdly enough, in at least the research I did, and if I turn out to be wrong, please send it to me and tell me I'm wrong. But a version of the Grand Cherokee might be the first luxury SUV in the United States. And by that rubric, probably possibly ever, there was a model that debuted in 1966 called the Super Wagoneer. Um, First off, I love the name. Like how super, how do you how do you not love super. the super wagoneer? Um, and so here is from Four Wheeler Magazine a little bit about it the Jeep, the new Jeep super wagoneer and what it was in general was a grand wagoneer with every bell and whistle that they had that they could put on it. Um, it I had, love that super wagoneer. It's it's not two words. It's one. Well, I think that's actually, I I think that's a problem with Four Wheeler Magazine at the time, because if you look (laughs) at the actual issue, it is. Oh, it is two words. It it is two words. I reject that reality. It is one word in my mind from this point forward. Precisely. But um, I do have some images of the interior of it. And um, it's a very nice, especially by the standards of the time, it had bucket seats. One apparently of the major selling points was the, um, oh, here's the exterior, sorry. So it was two-tone. So you had a body and mostly one color, and then you had the stripe going down the side that was a second color. I especially love the woman on the left in her white pants who is just super impressed by this SUV. <laughs> <laughs> old press photos. Oh, dude, I love old press. Ooh, so We now, need to do an old press photo episode at some point. <laughs> you saying that, and we're going to do it, I promise. Now- uh, Wait, 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 wait. Here, let me get you that interior photo. I promised. Um, I'm probably going to pick the wrong one because I have several images up. Oh, I got the right one. So you can see bucket seats. Apparently, one of the selling points of the Super Wagoneer was that center console you can see there. So it had the gear shift in the center console. And then the shifter you see above it was for the four wheel drive system. Well, and that answered I, my question right there. If 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 that had actual four wheel drive, because did, yes. because from the outside, I mean, it kind of looks more like just a station wagon than you would expect a truck to look. But no, four wheel drive on this thing. And remember the context of the day. Yeah, this is sixty six. We're talking about this is trucks and vehicles like this were not ornate. If you had, well, I mean, I you can see there's you chrome. Can get, there's a full center yeah. console, which at the time was a thing bucket seats like if you had a truck by 66 with a standards dash, this was nice it was a big deal yeah 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 um and so i do also want to share how things evolve so this is the final year and also the nicest of the grand cherokee so this is past super cherokee times um but um this is fi- what you got kind of at the end and again that looks nice by modern standards. You yeah. can see the wood, you see the dark leather, yep. you see, you know, there is cloth in the center of the seats, but like, you know. That's a, that's a posh interior and they, they hold up too. They are comfortable, comfortable, comfortable vehicles, even by modern standards. They ride great, great interiors, so much cushion in those seats. Oh, they're wonderful. And and I think that's partly why the Grand Wagoneer, the the previous generation. I love that I can say previous generation now because there is <laughs> yeah. a current generation. The, that previous generation Wagoneer has quite a following behind yeah. it. There are people that yeah. 
actively search these out just because and prices on them are going up quickly. Like yes, if you are. want one, now is get the it. time to get it get because it. it it's not going to last that much longer. You're going to have two six figure Grand Wagoneer options within a few years. You can either buy a 91 or a 2021. <laughs> you uh you are not wrong. You're not wrong there. So, but what is kind of the next generation of luxury SUV in the United States? So the Range Rover, Land Rover Range Rover, it debuted in uh, 69. From the research I saw, it went on sale in the UK in 70. But anyone want to guess when we got it here? When it finally went on sale in the US? Wasn't it the 80s or something? It's the late 80s. It debuted at the 87 LA Auto Show. So it's, you know, it's. That kind of boggles, I would say, I mean, that kind of boggles the mind because I, I mean, I think about the, the history of the vehicle and yeah, it, it didn't, it didn't arrive here until. It also meant that. Until surprisingly recent. It also meant that Jeep had the absolute corner on the market for, you know, for kind of a luxury station wagon SUV kind of thing, because the other alternatives through the seventies and eighties would have been what the, the Chevy blazer, which was a, a two door, two row removable hardtop machine. That was a little more rough and tumble. The Ford maybe Bronco, the which suburban, was the maybe, I don't know that you could, I mean, you might've been able to get like a conversion, a, a some kind of leather, leather seat conversion on the suburban, but I don't think yeah. it had really a whole lot of luxury features like the Wagoneer did. Yeah. No, um, it, it, was, it wasn't like the Wagoneer. I mean, you could, you could get a nice, you know, a nice suburban, but no, nothing, nothing like what you saw with that Wagoneer. Yeah. So you, the the photo really had, now is a U.S. market uh, Range Rover. And every, anyone who knows me knows who I love dogs. So we have, woman with a bunch of collies and i assume they're all going to fit in the back of that range rover it's gonna of be a course they day. will because they're good little boys well there's four those collies are big and there's four of them they're, so they're good little boys it's they'll gonna be a tight be. fit but yeah that this is how land rover was selling the range rover at the time um once it made it to the united states it, clearly this is a very posh woman she's got her leather boots on looks like she's got joppers on. So she must've been riding a horse recently. And she's got a bunch of very pretty dogs. <laughs> I love how you can pull all of this information. She, uh, yeah. must've been riding a horse recently. Um, it, it's possible that she drank some Folgers earlier in the day. Um, Bruce is going to be writing a movie on the life of that woman in a couple of <laughs> the movie on the life of that woman is going to be coming out in a couple of years. So keep your eyes peeled. I would do that. I love movies, but anyway, land, um, land, visions of Land Rover. Yeah, but any, <laughs> so, but it's interesting though because so we have the um, sorry, we have the Grand Wagoneer, we have the Range Rover arriving later, and then it takes a little while. But Jeep is kind of the next one to exploit the market with the Grand Cherokee. So they, you know, they have the regular Cherokee at the time that you know I well, think everyone is familiar with. You you are aware though that there was one more Grand Wagoneer after 1991. Yes. What was there? I there, don't there know was, that I was. There was one more Grand Wagoneer after 1991. It was a Grand Wagoneer in name only because what it actually was was a Jeep Grand Cherokee with wood sides <laughs> and a Grand Wagoneer badge. I, I, you know, I got to be honest with you. I wasn't aware of that. They did it for 1993 only. It was the top trim for the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Um, here, I've got a picture really quick. I can toss up there. Go for it. That's that's the 1993 Jeep Grand Wagoneer, and and that's why I said earlier, you know, the first legit new Grand Wagoneer in forever because technically. This was the previous generation Grand Wagoneer, and it was really just a badged, wood-sided Grand Cherokee. Little, little bit, little bit of neat history. A lot of people kind of miss that, but and and I mean, really, it, it wasn't a Grand Wagoneer. It was. It was a one Grand of those. A peak. Am I making this up, or is one of those in like Jumanji or one of those early '90s like kids action films? 
I swear I remember seeing that in something like that. I bet a gazillion dollars you remember seeing the wood-sided Ford Taurus in Christmas Vacation. No, I own there that was, movie on Blu-ray. Trust me, was, don't, that's not what I'm thinking of. There was also the um, the XJ-based Grand Wagoneer, or not the Grand Wagoneer, the XJ-based Jeep Wagoneer that I remember vividly from Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. Is that what you're thinking of, Bruce? It might be. I, wow. I won't like... That's definitely a film I watched a lot as a child, so yep. I can't like discount that. We're yep. dipping a little bit into last week's episode. I here know with we some, need we, with some pop culture. Let me just throw out too the uh, the Grand Wagoneer from What About Bob as another like seminal oh, family I automotive seen that movie in ages. <laughs> Doctor Marvin, what's his name? Doctor Marvin. <sighs> anyway, Doctor Marvin the, drives Brett. a uh, Grand Wagoneer. Pulling but, these things out of the out of the sky and just nailing it, yeah. But anyway, so, so when we were talking be- before this episode, <laughs> you know, there was post Grand Wagoneer. There was kind of these, I, I guess you'd call them pseudo luxury crop SUVs. Is that fair, Brett? So you mentioned to me the uh, uh, Ford Explorer Limited which I honestly, until I looked up a picture of, I hadn't remembered at all. And the Mercury Mountaineer. And those kind of came between 93 when you get the Grand Cherokee. But then in 98, like, or or, I'm sorry, 97, um, things just explode. Yeah. So you have uh, the the photo we're looking at here, first gen navigator. Um, and, it's and I th- and I think that's I think that's a pretty attractive. I mean, I remember when that came out. That that's an attractive full size SUV. Yeah, like Definitely. yeah. I, I, I'm not gonna. You're not gonna get an argument for me. Following year from that, you get probably the one that breaks the ice the most. And I doubt you guys are gonna disagree with me. You get the Escalade. <laughs> I just, I have to laugh because I knew where you were going with this. The Lincoln Navigator was a really attractive full-size SUV that I remember back in the day. Nobody really said, oh, well, that's just a badged-up Ford. But the Escalade, when this first generation came out, everybody was just like, well, that just looks kind of terrible. It's just a Suburban with a Cadillac badge and some grill. Well, it kind of does, and, to be fair. Well, like The, well, the and, beginning and it, was not a good point it is. for that. Yeah. No, it, it, it wasn't. And in fact, I remember it being so bad that people were drawing comparisons to this and the and the Chevrolet Cavalier up badged caddy version, the, the Cadillac Cimarron. I mean, it was it was just kind of like, wow, is GM really going to just put a Cadillac badge on its Chevy Suburban and then jack the price by like 20 or 30 grand or whatever it was? I can't remember what the price was back in the day, yeah. but I definitely remember. I mean, I was just starting to, I mean, I was still a younger guy, just starting to get my feet wet in cars. And I remember that being just a huge deal that, wow, what is Cadillac thinking? This isn't going to go anywhere. And I think the first <laughs> generation Navigator outsold the Escalade kind of for that reason. Is it, was, it, did. It, was, it was a proper, I mean, if you look inside, you can definitely see a lot of Expedition in that yes. Navigator if you really kind of try. But I think it was still... Uh, much better selling than the Escalade. And we all kind of, you know, I, I remember that. I remember thinking, oh, you know, this, Everybody, this, this yeah. Cadillac's not going to take. And then lo and behold, I mean, it is the juggernaut. It is the name. When you're talking about a luxury SUV, it is the name. Well, I mean, so, I think oh. I think they were smart. They went back and said, okay, we need to do more than this. Yes, it's always mm-hmm. going to be suburban based, but we need to do more to this to make it it's gotta look a good, Cadillac. Yeah. This, I mean, this, this first generation Escalade, it looked kind of like just a kind of a, a quick off the cuff response. We need to come out with something. Yeah. And yeah, the, the baller SUV back then wasn't the Escalade. It was the navigator, but that changed in a, in a big hurry in the two thousands. And then 2000 model year, we got the BMW X five. And sadly I lost my image of the Mercedes ML class. Um, That's okay. Which, we don't need to see it, <laughs> <laughs> which came out a few years earlier, but ML X5, that was that was kind of the turning point in a certain way. Mm-hmm. It showed that this luxury crossover thing wasn't purely an American idea. Mm-hmm. That and it and it wasn't going to be a flash in the pan. Yeah, that too. And I remember also when the X5 came out, and a lot of 
a lot of um, auto news outlets were kind of scratching their heads. Okay, BMW, are you really going to try to sell us on this SUV thing when you've been the ultimate driving machine for all of these years and you've wowed us with the M3 and the M5 and now you expect us to buy into this X5? And pff, once Clearly again, they who, did because look knew? at BMW's lineup today. You have, depending on where you live, we've discussed this on our chat. You have X1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And and you know what? On the way. Yep. Uh, yeah, X8 is on the way. Yes, you're right. But last year? You at least have 1 through 7, 8 is coming. And last year, BMW sold, what, 50,000 X5s? I didn't write down the three series. I think they sold less three series. Oh, I, I did. I did write down seven series. How many seven series do you think they sold last year? Eight thousand, maybe six thousand, six thousand four hundred and forty three and yeah. fifty thousand X fives and twenty. What was that? Twenty thousand five hundred X sevens. Well, and did you know that Versus- because of the because of the X five and X seven? BMW is America's number one exporter of vehicles because those vehicles are built in Spartanburg, South Carolina and global popularity of those vehicles means that more BMWs get exported from the United States than any other brand. <laughs> like, huh. so, so they are popular worldwide. It is not an American thing. And you know, BM, in that BMW USA loves to talk about how much they're contributing to the American economy by building these hugely popular vehicles in South Carolina and then exporting them all over the world. Well, hey, give them the credit. Well, everyone, I thanks for joining with us today. Um, we're kind of trying to keep this episode short, both for some time constraint reasons, but also just out of pure curiosity, whether you guys prefer shorter episodes. So if you do prefer short. shorter episodes, tell us. If you want longer episodes, also tell us that because we want to know. Again, it's podcast at motorone.com or you can comment on the episode on YouTube, or you can comment on the episode at motor1.com. Um, so yeah, we want to know, but also we always appreciate you listening. Every single person who takes the time to listen to our dumb asses, like spout, <laughs> to listen to us ramble about cars. We appreciate that. So thank you. Um, Share the love, like, and subscribe. And um, no, and like, and follow. Oh, that's right. Like, and follow because this is absolutely free. You do not have to subscribe to anything. We're not going to spam you with stuff like, and follow. And I also want to say a special thanks to Brett for joining us back to back here, Brett, this is our 10th episode and it's been a pleasure having you here and uh, your knowledge here on the new grand Wagoneer invaluable. And folks, if you have any questions on the grand Wagoneer and we suspect there are going to be some send them on over, we'll get you taken care of. And just real quick, Brett, do you have any social media, anything like that that you want to promote? Well, obviously, Motor One Com on on Instagram. We're we're uh, we're growing fast, and we want to keep growing. So go hit Absolutely. go hit follow at Motor One Com on Instagram. Uh, personal Instagram is Brett underscore T underscore Evans, uh, just like my just like my username there. So care to follow, feel free to follow there. Um, but thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to have been here and. Looking forward to seeing Wagoneers on the road and, and uh, it was a lot of fun kind of reminiscing about some of these old 80s and 90s luxury SUVs too. So thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation. Time right. goes by quick. And you know what? Also, folks, stay tuned. We'll have our first drive coming up here probably sooner rather than later. We're going to get behind the wheel and we're going to see just how awesome this thing is. Yeah. And good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Whenever you're listening to this, we appreciate you. So thanks a lot and bye-bye. <laughs>